Hi, this is History with me, Dan, and this video is about a lost theater in Hartford, Connecticut called The Grand. Built on the site of Hartford's Fourth Congregational Church of 1850, The Grand opened in 1914. Over the years, it changed its name a number of times, and its emphasis would shift from burlesque theater to vaudeville theater to films, and for a brief period in the early 1950s, it became the New Parsons Theater, a venue for what's called legitimate theater, meaning professionally produced stage plays. In 1961, however, just a decade after the opening of the New Parsons, the building was demolished to make way for Interstate 84, which plowed right through downtown Hartford. So let's delve into the history of this lost building, starting with its predecessor, the Fourth Congregational Church, then moving on to the theater, which stood on Main Street for less than 40 years, but was the scene of much theatrical history. The Grand Theater was located on the west side of Main Street, just beyond the intersection with Morgan, Village, and Windsor Streets. As I mentioned, Hartford's Fourth Congregational Church was erected here in 1850. The church had been established in 1832 and had previously used a building further south on Main Street that was later replaced by the Wise Smith Department Store. The church's 1850 edifice had a tall steeple that towered over the stretch of Main where the street bends to the northwest. The building was designed by Sidney Mason Stone, an architect from New Haven, and it was modeled on that city's center church on the green. In 1850, the pastor of the Fourth Congregational Church was Reverend William Weston Patton, an abolitionist who later became president of Howard University. Many years before a theater was erected here, the church had its share of notable appearances. As a reporter for the Hartford Current newspaper noted, Over the years, the church hosted, quote, many noted evangelists to hear whom great audiences packed the edifice. Jenny Lind sang there, as did many other musicians of the time. Great lecturers were heard there, and one of the earliest accounts of an entertainment in the church was when an expert in the art of the counterfeiters gave a lecture illustrated by large charts of the bank bills then in circulation and their imitations, and by a hand press such as was used by the forgers of paper money set up and operated on the platform. Real counterfeit money was produced while the audience waited, and so successful was the lecturer that he remained in the city for some time." Unquote. The appearance by Jenny Lind, the Swedish Nightingale, on July 5, 1851, was notable for the chaos that ensued. Some in the crowd that came to hear her were angered in the manner that the tickets were doled out. Those left outside were furious at the favoritism shown by the ticket seller that denied them entrance. When the windows were closed halfway through the performance so that they could no longer hear her, they began to riot outside. The mayor, police, and fellow citizens could not quiet the mob, whose shouts disrupted Lynn's performance of her famous bird song. She rushed through the rest of her program, and with a large crowd surrounding the church, she had to escape through the back door of the lecture room and through the yard of Reverend Mr. Patton to Trumbull Street, and from there to the train station to be whisked away on a special car to Springfield. When the church's congregation moved to the corner of Albany Avenue and Vine Street in 1914, the columned front portico and tall spire of the 1850 structure 
were relocated to become part of the new church, which was designed by the architectural firm of Davis and Brooks. This grand building still exists today. Returning to Main Street, on February 1, 1914, the Hartford Current newspaper reported that work was well underway to build a theater called the Grand in place of the old church. Quote, the theater, which will seat 1,600, is to be ready by the 1st of September, and already workmen are far advanced on the brick walls of the building, which is built around a small portion of the walls and roof of the old church. In the new theater, not much will be left of the old fourth church. The two side walls will be left standing, and a portion of the roof which covers them. All else will be of new construction. The old church galleries which have been left up so that the workmen might use them, and which many people have thought are to be included in the new theater, will be taken down before long." Unquote. The church had been acquired by three brothers, Isidore, Abraham, and Michael Goldberg. Six years earlier, they demolished the old gambrel-roofed building just north of the church and replaced it with a new five-story office building. Now they were erecting the even larger theater, designed by architect Fred C. Waltz right next door. The Hartford Current marveled at the growth experienced by this section of Main Street in that space of time. When the Goldbergs had purchased the older building in 1908, quote, they paid $400 a front foot for the land and were characterized as foolish for paying so much for property in that section of the city. It is understood that they paid $1,400 a front foot for the church property and consider that they bought it at a reasonable figure, unquote. The Goldbergs explained to The Current that they were not theater men, so they planned to lease the new building to the Strand Theater Company of New York, which that same year, 1914, had erected the now lost Strand Theater, which showed silent films at the corner of Broadway and 47th Street in Manhattan. The company also had several other theaters in the Northeast, run by their general manager, Max Spiegel. The plan for the Grand in Hartford, which opened on Labor Day, 1914, was to have performances by companies that were part of the Columbia burlesque circuit. Burlesque had a risque reputation, but Spiegel had done much to produce shows that were described as high-class burlesque. Spiegel hired Mo Messing to manage the Grand Theater. On July 1, 1914, Messing told The Current, quote, We have a beautiful theater here, and we believe Hartford and the surrounding towns will respond to what we intend to give them. Nothing in the world is more erroneous than the idea that some people have of the burlesque we are bringing to Hartford. Many people believe that our shows will appeal to those who want something off-color and that the Grand will not be a fit place for decent people to go. They are wrong, all wrong. The shows that will play at the Grand will be burlesque only in name. They will be nothing more nor less than two-part musical comedies of high grade with large companies and lavish costuming. There will be nothing coarse or vulgar and nothing to offend. Every man connected with the house will be a gentleman. And if, at any time, we find that we have made a mistake and employed someone who is not, that man will go immediately. We propose to cater especially to women. We want them to feel at home at the Grand and to know that they can come here and have a good time without seeing or hearing anything that can offend. I am sure that after the Grand has been opened a week, any who may have objections to burlesque coming to Hartford will withdraw their criticism and become regular patrons of the theater." Unquote. The burlesque shows were a hit, 
and Messing became a popular manager during his two very successful seasons at the Grand. Over the coming years, the Grand would continue to present a variety of theatrical performances as well as motion pictures. In 1930, the Grand was renamed the Cameo Theater and focused on vaudeville. In 1938, there would be another name change when the theater became part of Fred Lieberman's Boston-based theater chain called Proven Pictures. The name derived from the fact that the theater would only show a carefully curated selection of films whose success and value had already been proven. Hartford's Proven Pictures Theater opened in February of 1938 with showings of two 1937 films, Paul Muni in the Life of Emile Zola and George Brent and Beverly Roberts in God's Country and the Woman. That June, the theater was involved in a labor dispute that led to several weeks of picketing by the International Alliance of Theater Stage Employees and Motion Picture Operators. Tensions were still high when, on the night of Sunday, July 31, 1938, nearly 1,400 people were driven from the theater after two homemade tear gas bombs exploded under a seat in the theater's rear row. Proven pictures weathered these labor troubles and continued in operation in Hartford until 1944. On April 21, 1943, the theater hosted the New England premiere of the film Corregidor with a special showing for purchasers of war bonds. Station WTHT broadcast from the theater's lobby, and the Bradley Field Air Corps Band played out front for 15 minutes and then later gave a concert on the stage inside. Also in attendance were the father and brother of Louis Rio, a prisoner of war being held by the Japanese. A little over a year later, the theater would experience yet another name change. Proven Pictures was out and Dow's Theater was in. Operated by Al Dow of the Paramount Vaudeville Agency, its opening represented a return to the type of performances that had flourished in the theater in years past. A dramatic incident occurred in December of 1945 when the theater's marquee, loaded down by uncleared snow, crashed onto the sidewalk below. A startled pedestrian managed to jump back in the nick of time. Not long thereafter, Dow's theater was out and the theater reverted to its original name of The Grand, with the now familiar mix of live theatrical performances alternating with motion pictures. As described by the Hartford Current on February 5, 1946, shortly after 10 p.m., the movie audience's attention was drawn away from the screen when they noticed a stray cat that had descended from a skylight and was balancing precariously on the rim of the theater's big chandelier. A policeman on duty called his captain who referred the matter to the fire department, which was uninterested in intervening. Finally, the Humane Society sent a man with a cat catcher. When the lights went up after the last show, the theater manager, ushers, stagehands, and the policemen rushed up to the balcony. But before they could attempt to capture, the cat, which couldn't endure the heat from the lights a moment longer, leapt thirty feet to the seats below, and, as the newspaper described it, quote, streaked out of the theater for parts unknown, unquote. Later that year, the building changed hands again, and the theater acquired yet another new name, the Center Theater, not to be confused with the Central Theater in West Hartford Center. Four years later, in 1950, the theater underwent extensive renovations and was rechristened the New Center Theater. The New Center advertised that its focus would be in showing foreign films, but sadly 
this Hartford venue for subtitled films would be short-lived. The Grand Theater's next incarnation would be its most notable yet and would even get some unwanted national attention. But first, let's go back to April 1st, 1896. That was opening night at the Parsons Theater, which stood for 40 years at the point where Prospect Street becomes American Row, across from Central Row near the Old State House in downtown Hartford. The theater stood near where the Phoenix Building is today. During its early years, major stars often appeared at the Parsons because prominent Broadway productions, like the plays of George M. Cohan, would routinely have their tryouts at the theater before debuting in New York. By the 1920s, though, the theater was experiencing leaner times, and the Broadway shows were replaced by runs of stock companies and burlesque. In 1936, the building's new owner was the Hartford Steam Boiler Inspection and Insurance Company, which had recently erected its Art Deco-style headquarters next door. After being shuttered for a year, the Parsons had the chance to reopen by taking on a WPA dramatic project. But the insurance company was unwilling to pay for the necessary repairs that would allow this to happen, and instead the company decided to demolish the building, which had been the scene of so much theatrical history. So in 1936, Hartford had lost what had once been its most notable theatrical venue, but many longed for the return of so-called legit theater to the city. Fifteen years later, that dream was realized when the former Grand Theater on Main Street changed its name once again and became the new Parsons Theater. The previous year, 1950, an attempt to erect a new theater in West Hartford designed by Frank Lloyd Wright had failed due to local resistance. But on November 1, 1951, Legit Theater found a new Hartford area home at the New Parsons with a performance of the play Nina starring Gloria Swanson, David Niven, and Alan Webb. The premiere was attended by a slew of theatrical notables, including actors Alfred Lunt and Lynn Fontaine, Tallulah Bankhead, Fritzy Sheff, Alfred Drake, Walter Abel, Lillian and Dorothy Gish, and Hartford's own Sophie Tucker. Also present was Lawrence Langner of the Theater Guild, whose son Philip was one of the new Parsons' three managers. These special guests arrived in Hartford from New York on a private car owned by the head of the New Haven Railroad. Hopes were high for the new theater, whose organizers' stated aim was to, quote, revitalize the American theater through decentralization, unquote. Once again, Hartford had a venue for Broadway plays, but there was something that was bothering the three managers, and when they decided to take action in March of 1953, it led to a scandal that made national headlines and brought a lot of negative publicity. The source of their irritation was Theodore H. Parker, veteran theater critic for the Hartford Current. As the management described it, some of Parker's reviews of their plays over the previous two seasons had been savage, and they were angered that he'd panned a number of productions that had received favorable notice in New York. In early March of 1953, they demanded of the newspaper that Parker, quote, be taken off his beat, unquote, and that they were contemplating such actions as barring him from the theater, directly responding to his reviews on stage, or encouraging their patrons to write letters of complaint to the current. The paper refused to comply, and a week later, when Parker arrived at the New Parsons to review Clifford Odette's play The Country Girl on March 19th, he went to pick up his customary ticket, but he was denied entry, even when he presented a separate ticket 
that the current had purchased in advance in anticipation of trouble. The theater offered to refund the price of the ticket, but the paper's managing editor refused. The following day, the current left a blank space in its columns where the review would have appeared. The theater's lawyer soon issued a statement that claimed, quote, Mr. Parker has been unsympathetic and without understanding in his approach toward new plays and tryouts here in Hartford, unquote. Also, quote, we have brought the finest in American theater to Hartford and such leading stars as America's First Lady, Helen Hayes. In the best interests of good theater, we have seen fit to revoke a license which the theater ticket represents. We felt that good theater in central Connecticut would suffer had this action not been taken, unquote. The theater management even published an advertisement quoting messages of support that they had received, including one that characterized Parker's reviews as intellectual McCarthyism. The Hartford Current stood by its reviewer, noting of the incident that, quote, not even the death of Stalin provokes such lively comment hereabout, unquote. Messages poured into the current reflecting various opinions. A telegram in support was received from Odette's the playwright and a telephone call from columnist Walter Winchell, who also discussed the episode on his weekly TV broadcast. The story was also reported in the New York Times, whose theater critic Brooks Atkinson criticized the new Parsons' actions. Within months, the current was supporting a new bill in the state legislature under which places of entertainment would no longer have the right to bar anyone over 21 who'd bought a ticket and was not creating a disturbance. The bill passed and in July was signed into law by Governor John Davis Lodge, making Connecticut the third state after similar laws had been passed in New York and California to prevent the barring of critics. The current stated, however, that it was not going to use the new law as a way to end its dispute with the new Parsons, which had been maintaining its ban on Parker. The paper declared, that the critic would only return to the theater if he was invited by the management. This never happened, however, because the three owners, who broke even in the first season, were now losing money. They decided to abandon the theater at the close of their third season. The big problem was their trouble in getting enough plays for the season and they had to fill the gaps with movie showings. Alan Stewart, who had been general manager under the outgoing regime, attempted to continue for another season. He dropped the new from the theater's name, and in September 1954, he welcomed back T.H. Parker, the drama critic. But Stewart could not secure enough shows to complete the subscription season. In 1955, the theater again became a movie house. By 1959, the building's owners, who were taking a loss on the property, decided to open it to the public as a rental hall. But by then, the theater's days were numbered. In early 1961, it was demolished to make way for the construction of I-84. So let's summarize the vicissitudes of this lost Hartford landmark. As I said at the beginning, this was previously the site from 1850 to 1913 of the Fourth Congregational Church. The Grand Theater, specializing in burlesque, opened in 1914, and then from 1930 to 1938, it became the Cameo Theater, focused on vaudeville. Proven Pictures, where tear gas bombs once exploded, was here from 1938 until 1944, and then it had a brief return to vaudeville as Dow's Theater from 44 to 45. Movies were the mainstay when it returned to the grand name from 45 to 46, and it was then the center theater from 1946 to 1950. Foreign films dominated when it briefly became the new center theater from 1950 to 51. 
Then came its momentous three seasons as the New Parsons Theater from 1951 to 1953. Then it officially dropped the new to become the Parsons Theater, but was still often called the New Parsons Theater from 1953 until it was finally demolished at the start of 1961. If you want to learn more about Hartford's demolished movie theaters, check out my video on the subject. And don't forget to subscribe and hit the like button. Thanks for watching.